let's let's have uh, Dr. Hilton and actually Mr. Truman and Clay and Dr. Uh, Dines, if um, if you're if you're still here, if you can come up for a question and answer. So, uh, so please text your questions. While this is powering up a little bit, I wanted you to know uh, lunch will be served in 15 minutes. And um, if you have a ticket, um, that's great. You can go through the lunch line. Uh, many of you are late. If you don't have a ticket, there are other venues within the Hemmingson Center on the lower level uh, to have lunch. First question, where can I get Gail Dine's book? Yes. <laughs> Amazon. Amazon, the title is? Poor Lan, how porn is hijacked on. Uh, poor Lan, is it on? Nope. Thank you. It's called Pornland, How Porn Has Hijacked Our Sexuality. You can get it on Amazon. And also, um, if you're interested in sort of passing along what I said, there's a 13-minute TED Talk that I've done, which takes all of what I said and scrunches it into 13 minutes. And that's on YouTube. I got paid for that commercial. You did? Yeah. <laughs> and seeing I get a dollar a book, you can get 50 cents. <laughs> So does anyone like to answer this question? How much of the porn consumption is tied to masturbation? Are they the one and the same? I don't know if that should be by uh, Dr. Carnes, who would like to answer that, or anyone on this panel. Dr. Carnes, what do you say? I would say that it most frequently goes together, yes. Good. Um, I c I'd also like to say that What's interesting is when I often go on college campuses, so many young men come up to me and they say, well, if you take my porn away, what will I masturbate to? And I said, you know, men have figured that out, as have women, a long time ago. And there's a thing called imagination where you do that without using porn. But now pornography has basically killed the capacity to think of imagination or anything outside of sex that doesn't link sex and violence together. And uh, Victor Klein used to talk about masturbatory conditioning. It kind of goes with the learning script models that I spoke of earlier, where um, it's one thing to masturbate. It's another thing to masturbate in the context of facial ejaculation, of double pain, all, the, all of the things that we've discussed, I, these heavy subjects uh, today. And so then there's this, um, Initially, well, I'm masturbating to this sex scene that I've, yeah, that's a little uncomfortable, but it's like the cadaverine female. Eventually it's aversive. And then over time, when it's paired with this powerful sexual reward, it becomes appetitive. And so this masturbatory conditioning process is a powerful learning substrate for the brain. And it does change those grooves in the brain and those brain trails. Ste why don't, Stephanie, why don't you come up here? Yes, wait, yes, that, there's, here's, a, here's a seat for you. So I'm a clinical sexologist, and so this is a, a lot of what I've studied. And um, the early years between 6 and 12 in particular are considered very formative years for what we call the arousal template, which is what you become aroused by in your sort of erotic map. And so when people are exposed to um, you know, hardcore images at that age, that become, can become a core feature to the arousal template. So we have young people, and that occurs with exploitation and abuse as well. When people are experience sexual trauma at an early age, even though it's 
um, shameful for them or um, a very difficult experience, sometimes the elements of that uh, experience can become eroticized and become uh, part of their sexuality at a later point in time. So our young people are very uh, vulnerable during this time where their sexuality is really being formed. Very good, thank you. Yeah. Many of us want to help but are very busy. What's a realistic way I can help today? Anyone? Yeah, there, there's so many things that you can do uh, uh, that getting involved with an existing organization that, that you know, draws you in, that, that is working on things that you feel like are passionate to you. Um, and there are several organizations represented up here, but there are several that, that aren't that you can look into. Uh, there, there are ways that you can get involved on your own outside of get volunteering for an organization. There are ways that you can help contribute to projects that are being done. You can uh, do anything from uh, uh, writing a letter to somebody, uh, your congresswoman here in, the, in Washington. You can, you can uh, reach out to, to local schools and find out what they're doing and how you can kind of help uh, steer some of the, the, the content in, in a direction that's more healthy. There's so, uh, what we talk about in, at our organization is the fact that that, um, you know, a lot of people ask that question. A lot of people say, like, well, what can I do? And some of them are kind of wanting to get involved on the legislative side. And I know that uh, uh, Pat has, uh, you know, a lot of volunteers come to your organization looking to support and help and writing letters and whatnot. Uh, for us and what we're doing, it's all about kind of pushing the awareness to the youth. And so we have a lot of material and resources to help facilitate that. Uh, really, we just want to say, use that passion, use that energy. Um, and, and, uh, and connect it with some resources that are effective and been proven to be effective, and then uh, move in the direction that is more powerful. Um, I would say, <laughs> especially one thing to do is, given if you're bringing kids up, they need a peer group. And really, it shouldn't just be on the parents' shoulders. Where are the schools? And I think, you know, nothing scares a principal more than 10 angry parents walking into their office and saying, you know, we insist that you take on the fact that we are living in a society where our kids are being thrown porn at constantly. And what are you doing in this school to help build resilience and resistance to pornography and also to build peer groups where you know that if your kid goes for a sleepover or something, there is an agreement between the parents that the online life will be monitored, that they won't just leave them um, playing certain video games or watching porn. And then to be really crass, because many of us come from nonprofits, is one of the things nonprofits never have enough of is money. We, you know, struggle with that all the time because we all have visions of how we want to change the world. And I would say, and I'm sure you can all agree, those of us in a nonprofit, what stops us mainly is the fact we never have enough capacity to do the work that we want to do. I want to mention one thing also, and that um, is uh, we want to change the world. But if you want to change the world, I think you have to change the church and uh, whatever denomination you belong to. I find when I go into churches, I almost always look in the back of the church to see what the handouts are. And uh, you'll find handouts on climate change, on abortion, on uh, poverty, on whatever else. The one thing you rarely find is something on pornography. And this is an issue, priests tell me that, and I'm Catholic, priests tell me that uh, it's such a, a great number of young men in confession will confess the sin of pornography. And yet there's nothing in the back. I know priests who will give a handout at confession or suggest a website where an individual can go and get help because they do need help. That's why they're coming to confession. And, uh, the, you know, the, the research item that we've handed out here to everyone, that's just one item that uh, might th be of interest to find out what's happening to their brain. Uh, the church, it seems to me, every church could have uh, in, this, in the library of the church or library of the school, uh, some materials where someone can understand, like I said, what's happening in their brain, how to teach their kids about this, how to uh, clean up their own community. But I think the church should be involved. And the other thing too is that most people find that the last place they want to go to get help is the church because they feel they'll be shamed and that should be the first place so we should have a welcoming effort each church should develop some welcoming effort to um so that when an individual comes there's a plan 
not just an off-the-cuff remark, but a plan on how to help that individual. For example, every church should have a list of counseling agencies in the area or in the next area. Some may not want to go to their particular local counselor, they might know the town next door, but a list of counselors who specialize in uh, treating uh, individuals who are addicted to pornography. Uh, one other thing is on, in Christian schools, I think there, a curriculum should be developed appropriate for the age group so that the uh, uh, children are taught about this. They're either going to be taught by Google and the television or by uh, the church and the parents. So I think that if you ask what can you do, you can survey your community, survey your church, and see how to better it in these, in these regards. Uh, staying on that topic for a minute, a uh, question for you, Clay. Uh, do you find that parents or young people from religious backgrounds can tend to take a more moralistic approach to pornography? Do I find that parents of religious households take a more moralistic approach? Can tend, or would that be helpful? Um, I, the question is, yeah. do you find that parents or young people from religious backgrounds can tend to take a more realistic approach to pornography? I would think that's realistic. obvious. Realistic or moralistic? Realistic or moralistic? Moralistic. 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 Okay, I so apologize. do they take a more moralistic yes. approach? Yeah. Um, you know, we, what we found, you know, a lot of people think that uh, this issue, that the only people interested in talking uh, talking about it are the people that are taking a more moralistic approach. Gail represents an audience that, that uh, is more secular. Like that, we don't see that to be the case. As we go around, uh, uh, people of all communities and people of all kind of backgrounds are, are very interested in this topic and want to do something about it. And their motives might be different uh, between you know, the different organizations or different communities that they come from. But this is something that we are coming together on due to the fact that we're kind of packaging it. everyone up here is representing this on more on a public health level versus a moralistic or religious uh, standpoint. And, the, and people of all communities and, and faiths are coming together now. Um, in the individual households, uh, uh, faith and and uh, belief systems can be w incredibly powerful to uh, to uh, influence behavior and uh, and connect with the with youth as they educate. And so we don't we don't tell parents to not involve that if that's a part of their faith background. But rather to, uh, we, we say that first, um, listen when you're having that conversation with, with your child. Uh, first, listen and ask questions so you can understand where they're coming from, and what they know and what they don't know. And then uh, teach them the facts, something that we have now, we didn't used to have, and utilize that information. And then share your family values. And most parents skip one and two and jump right into number three. And we find that to be less effective as if you kind of follow that sequence. And number four would be repeat. You know, that's a rinse and repeat process. It's not a one-time conversation. It's an ongoing layered dialogue that starts sooner than you think and on into their adulthood. Um, something that, that it would be somewhat foreign to many of you. If I could ask the question, how many of you had the talk when you were growing up? Like your parents sat you down and talked to you about sexuality and other things of that nature. How many of you had that? <laughs> how many of you people didn't ever have that with your parents at all? Okay, I have a presentation. Just kidding. No. Um, <laughs> That, that's crazy, that's ridiculous that, that, that that's not a, a part of, of, parents need to be opening their mouths. We, or the last question before this one was, what can you do? Everybody has a voice. Um, you know, there's a lot of things we can do community-wise and externally, but ultimately we need to start with opening our mouths and having conversations and discussing this in our homes and, and, uh, and helping uh, particularly our youth navigate this world that they are now living in. I also would like to separate sort of a moralistic look to looking at morals. And I think it's very crucial for parents and everyone involved in bringing up children to help them develop their moral compass. And you want them not to choose pornography because they have a moral compass that leads them into making other choices. And I want to say, um, I recently just came off of, uh, speaking to of LA and I spoke in a lot of synagogues um, and temples and in um, what the synagogues and temples are doing, and I spoke with a very famous rabbi in LA and it was full and we talked about, in Judaism there's a concept in Hebrew, it's called tikkun olam, which means 
um, basically changing the world, repairing the world. And what we talked about was how Jews have been very much at the forefront of social movements that have been about repairing the world. And we have a different view to sex. There's, there's a different view that Jews have, I think, to Christians around sex. Um, but ultimately, we end up at the same place, is that we want our kids to have this moral compass where when you're not there, they make decisions that is about who they are and who they want to be as adults. And I think this transcends any individual faith and even transcends faith and says, who are we as human beings? If you take a moral compass out of us, we're left as empty shells. So I think you can also have a sort of non-religious approach to morals as the core of what it means to be human. Very good. I think we'll end there. Um, lunch will be served. Uh, again, if you have a ticket, wonderful. If uh, you don't, good luck to you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very, very much, panel. For the